we are going through a series we started on Easter. And this series was entitled, Don't Come In, Go Out. The whole entire premise of this series is the Great Commission. The Great Commission can be found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. And it's a charge from Jesus to not keep his message inside of us and only inside of us, but to go out and to tell the world of the story and the power of Jesus' name. We're looking at the book of Acts through this series. Acts is the book that follows the four Gospels. And it was recorded shortly after Jesus was ascended into heaven. And it details the foundation of the church and brings some great examples of biblical evangelism in the most early days. Today we entitled this message, How Lame. And we're not talking about Jesus or the disciples. They're not the lame ones here. But the people that Jesus and the disciples reached in their lives. In February, I did a series uh, called How Jesus Teaches. And we looked at the parables. We looked at parables that Jesus used to, to explain the gospel, to explain his life. And the purpose behind that series was to take how Jesus teaches and implement that into our own lives. The disciples did this exact same thing. The disciples walked with Jesus for three years, constantly learning and doing ministry with Jesus. They knew Jesus intimately. And he had trained them well for life after he was gone. Now, a sight aside that I always find interesting and fascinating is that sometimes we of the church want to be the perfect people because that's who the Christians are. That's how the world views Christians anyways. And we want to be that. You can't be a Christian and stumble and sin, although we all do that. In some ways, people think, hey, if I, had, if I had just met Jesus, then I could believe in him. But because I've never met him. But what's fine fascinating is the disciples, the people that walked with Jesus everywhere he went for three years, didn't get it. They didn't understand what was going to happen. They still thought that Jesus was going to come in and he was going to take down the world. And they just didn't understand. It wasn't until Jesus was actually crucified and raised back to life that the disciples' eyes were truly opened. And they were prepared to take the torch from Jesus and fulfill what he was asking them to do. The disciples had the, the ability to walk with Jesus, to be with Jesus, and yet they couldn't fully understand until after the fact. Many times in Jesus' ministry, he heals the disenfranchised or untouchables. He, he deals with the untouchables. Sometimes he dealt with people that the Jews would not have ever associated with. He healed blind men, a person who was sick or even raised them to life from death. Sometimes it was ministering to the S Samaritan woman at the well or the Samaritan on the side of the road. But we're going to look at one story in particular. It comes out of John 5, 1, and it is Jesus healing a lame man. John chapter 5 says, Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for a feast of the Jews. Now there in Jerusalem near a, the Sheep Gate was a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethsaida, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. 
the blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who, had, one who was there had been invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him laying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Interesting, and we've talked about this many times, but interesting that the man doesn't actually answer the question that Jesus asks because he has such a concrete view of what his life is like. Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me get into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once the man was cured and he picked up his mat and he walked. And there's more that happens out of that story, but that's where we're going to stop. Jesus uses all sorts of opportunities and tactics to do ministry throughout his life. In this case, he simply asks this man a question. Do you want to get well? He doesn't call up a great wind or come over and touch him and he electrifies him. He doesn't do any of the, the laying on of hands or bring people around and pray for him. It's just a simple question. Do you want to get well? If you ever drive around Rochester downtown or even the fringe areas of downtown, I go, my, my company's office is on North Winton. So if you take 490 and you get off at 490 and turn left onto North Winton, almost every single day that I go there, no matter, uh, maybe not at 6 in the morning, but by 7, there's a man standing there holding up his cardboard sign. He's homeless, or his sign says so, and he's looking for something, money or food. There was a guy in Buffalo one year that I saw was, I'm hungry, so I went and got him something to eat. But almost every single day, there is somebody at that intersection, and often it's the same person. There's other intersections over by uh, 104 where you get off near Portland. Almost always, there's a person sitting there. People go to where it makes sense for them to go. It was no different in the back, back in the biblical time. People would go to places that people could be and would help them and give them money. And that was completely normal in that time. In Jesus' day, people who are sick, people who uh, have... Um, mental disabilities, they weren't just disregarded, but they were actually just cast off and given their own space, which is a little bit different than how we are today. But people of disability, people that are sick, still have somewhat of a stigmatism to them. Stigmatism? Stigma. I think stigmatism's in the eye. Not that. Stigma to them. So we're going to fast forward to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, let me find it before I jump in, otherwise I'll never be able to do it. This is uh, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. In the book of Acts, there is a man, he is sitting by the most beautiful gate that led to the temple. Makes sense. Where a lot of people are going to pass through, they're going to the temple, a lot of people are going to funnel through to the temple through that gate. Peter and John are headed to church for a prayer meeting. Now, if the beggar here in Rochester, is any good, if you want to call it that, 
they will intentionally make eye contact with you. They will look at you through your car windows, or some people I've seen wave. They're doing anything they can to engage with the people coming by. In Acts 3, Peter and John are headed to this prayer meeting, and there's a beggar stationed by the most beautiful gate. You will we'll read here in a second that not only did the beggar, but Peter and John look directly at this beggar, and they engaged him themselves. Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 3. When Peter and John, about to enter, when, yes, about to enter, he asked them for money. And Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave him his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. But I have to give you, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate, called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what happened. Peter and John engaged this man. Now, if you can imagine, this guy must have had somewhat of a roller coaster of emotions here. There's people coming his way. They must have a gift for me. He asks for money. And when Peter and John engage with him, he must have gotten excited that they were going to give him something. But Peter's reply is, I don't have what you're looking for. I don't have money to give to you. I don't have silver or gold. And at hearing this, he must have been let down by that. But Peter then says, I will give you what I have to give you. Oh, okay, this is interesting. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. The elation that he must have had as he was brought to his feet for the first time in his life, this man was born lame. As the bones and the ligaments strengthened within his feet and his ankles, it must have been amazing. But they didn't heal this man only for his own sake. They healed this man as a testimony of the power of the name of Jesus. And there's one major difference between the two stories that we've looked at. The one major difference from Jesus' ministry and the apostles' ministry is where the power comes from, sort of, I guess. Peter and John, when, when Jesus was healing people, he was healing people in the name of God as Jesus as God. But Peter and John boldly say in the power of Jesus Christ. The man who came to earth and changed everything. The people that were around, the people within the temple that sent Jesus to die and release the criminal just days before, weeks before. The man who overcame death, proving that he is, in fact, the Son of God, the Messiah that everybody was waiting for. He said, it's in Jesus' name that you are healed. Okay? So this is a beautiful parallel of Jesus' ministry and the beginning of the disciples' ministry. Both Jesus and the apostles had the ability to heal people. But what if you were not 
the guy who was born lame, and you were one of the other people that is still just as disabled as this man, but yet you were not healed. Or what about us? Have you ever healed a man born blind or a cripple on your own? Or even somebody who had a broken bone, were you able to speak Jesus' name and heal them? I haven't. To be concerned with that is missing the point. In order to spread the gospel, in order to bring the gospel to the world, to bring Jesus' name, we have to follow along with what the Holy Spirit says. In this case, the Holy Spirit told Peter and John this man would be healed. And they followed along with that understanding. And they didn't just go back and heal all the rest of the people. That wasn't God's point. The disciples don't have any more power or ability than anyone here. The disciples, of course, had time with Jesus, but that doesn't make them special. They were the leaders of the church because Jesus trained them to be that. The disciples were just figuring it all out as they were in their place in the body of Christ, just like each and every one of us here. Not everybody in the, in the world is going to be called to be leaders like the disciples. Not everyone is going to be called to go out and heal people. But we can take our own personal journeys and we can understand that the disenfranchised of the world, Jesus had an amazing heart for. And the apostles had an amazing heart for. Just because we've never done some of these miraculous things, maybe, doesn't mean that we're not called to fulfill the Great Commission. There are opportunities all over our city. There are missions that are all over the world. We can get involved with different things that are going on. Just two weeks ago, I spent my week at Flower City Work Camp. Flower City is just one of those organizations that we, the entire purpose, the theme and the, the, the mission of Flower City Work Camp is that the city might see Jesus. Now, we're not going around with tracks to the city. We're going around and working on homes. We're using the skills and the abilities that we have. And through a lot, people allowing us to come into their homes, we are able to share the gospel. They run a VBS throughout the week for children around the city or sports camps. All of these things are opportunities to bring people in that people can hear the gospel in ways that are important to them. We have a box back in the corner of donation stuff that's going to Open Door Mission to service the people that are homeless in our community. The Open Door Mission takes volunteers for serving meals. They serve meals every single day of the week at dinner time. There are opportunities to serve the disenfranchised right in our own community. There are women's shelters in the city. There are volunteer programs for the children of Galasano Children's Hospital. Food Link is a wonderful place. We've gone and the youth group has gone and do, uh, volunteered time to just help them sort food. There are many ways and opportunities to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our own city, in our own community, or across the world. We have our, our school in Honduras that we've supported for many, many years. I've been there twice. And to see the children that are so happy to learn 
because that's all that they have. Or the church and an orphanage in Africa that takes children in that would have to manage to survive any way possible that we support in Africa. There are many opportunities. It takes us, the people of God, to step out, to step out of our comfort zones and our routines to serve our community, to serve the people that Jesus loves, which is everyone, and bring Jesus to those who don't know him. As I was preparing to read through this, uh, as I was preparing to bring this message, I started reading through Acts. It's a good book. You should read it. I'm sure many of you have read it. But as we're going through this, this series, we're going to be looking at the entirety of the book of Acts. And the book of Acts, like I said at the beginning, is just the foundation of the church. If we want to learn how it is that we go out and we reach and we multiply God's chosen people, not that are sitting here in this group, but that believe in Jesus, Acts is a great place to gain that information. The disciples, they mirrored what Jesus did. They loved on the people in need. Yes, they were able to heal just like Jesus did. But they fulfilled and are, are expecting that we also fulfill the Great Commission by bringing the message of Jesus Christ to the world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this series. You came and you did all of the legwork. You turned the tables over. You flipped over every understanding that we possibly could have ultimately giving your own life on the cross. You trained people, ordinary people. You trained them to do extraordinary things. Because it's not by our power, it's not by our intelligence, it's not by our drive, it's by the power of your name. Father, instill that in us today. Not to just get comfortable here in these chairs, hearing a nice message every week, singing a couple songs. If that's all we're doing, we're missing the point. We're missing who you are and what you have asked us to be. I pray that we are able to find what you want of us, step out of our comfort zones, bring your name to all of the world. In your name we pray. Amen.